Hello, I'm Ben Godwin. Welcome to the Word Workshop recorded at the Good Springs Full Gospel Church. God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy. My wife Michelle and I have pastored the Good Springs Full Gospel Church since 1999. A spirit-filled church with a hunger for God and a heart for people. Good Springs Full Gospel Church is located in Walker County on Highway 269, 10 miles south of Jasper. The prophet said that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So prepare your hearts to receive from the Word, because when all else fails, God's Word works. Praise God. I saw this I thought was good. Prayer is the place where burdens change shoulders. If you've got a heavy burden today, why don't you unload it and let Jesus carry that heavy burden. Amen? I thought this was pretty good. The, the caterpillar says to the butterfly, you've changed. The butterfly says, we're supposed to. I don't want to stay the same. Do you? I mean, no, we're in a growth process. We're being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Well, go with me real quick to the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation, chapter number 2. So glad you're here today. I believe the Lord wants to speak to your heart. I'm going to use for a subject a white stone and a new name. Everybody say a white stone and a new name. Jesus promised every overcomer to receive a white stone and a new name. We're going to look at the significance of that. Are you there in Revelation chapter 2? 
in verse 17, uh, Jesus issued seven different promises to these seven churches. And I want to focus in on the specific promise he made to the church at Pergamos. Now, I'm putting it up in the New King James. The wording is just a little different, but let's uh, read it together. Verse 17, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone. Everybody say it again, a white stone. And in the stone a new name written which no man knows except he that receives it. We will have a white stone and a new name. Just for fun, just for kicks, look around at somebody and tell them your middle name. Will you do that? How many, how many like your middle name? How many don't like your middle name? How many never use your middle name? How many use your middle name as your given or called name? How many won't lift your hand for anything? Okay. I guess we, we covered all the bases right there. Why will we have or need a new name in heaven? That's what I want to explore. Let's talk about the significance of a name. A name is a label or a designation that identifies us or sets one person apart from another. We will have a new name in heaven. Now, whether we're called by that new name or our earthly name, the Bible doesn't say. I would tend to think we would be called by our heavenly name or new name. You may not call me Ben in heaven. I may have a name that you've never heard of that... Uh, God is going to reveal in time. What does the new name indicate? Let me show you this. Whenever there is a new name or a name change in Scripture, it indicates a change of identity, a change of relationship, or a change of nature. Let me give you some examples. Abram's name was changed to Abraham. Why? Because something changed in his identity and his relationship with God. What about Jacob? His name was changed from Jacob, which means deceiver or supplanter, to Israel, which means a prince of God. Why? There was a change of relationship, a change in his nature. The same is true with Paul. The apostle Paul was known as Saul. But God changed his name to Paul, which means small or little one. Why? Because as Saul, he thought he was a big shot. And Saul, he thought he was so important, he went around imprisoning, persecuting, uh, and even executing dis, uh, dis disciples and followers of Jesus. But God not only changed his heart, he changed his name to indicate the nature change. He became little in his own eyes, and God began to use him. So whenever there's a name change in Scripture, it usually indicates a change of identity, a change of nature, or a change in relationship. How about 2 Corinthians 5, 17? Brother Jerry, you quoted this during Sunday school. If any man or any person be in Christ, they are a what? A new creature. Say it with me. All things pass away and what? All things become new. Why do we need a new name? Well, if we become a new creature, we have a new identity in Jesus Christ. So we're going to have a new name to go with that new nature. Hallelujah. It will be revealed in time. There's an old song. I don't, I don't know if you've heard it. It's an old hymn I grew up singing. There's a new name written down in, in, in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. And the white-robed angels sing the story. A sinner has come home. There's a new name written down in heaven, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more to roam. I've got a new name and a new nature to go with it. Amen? So let's, let's walk that through for just a minute. I was lost, but now I'm... I was blind, but now I... I was in darkness, but now I'm a child of the light. I was bound, but now I'm free. I was an enemy of God, but now I'm a friend of God. I was a sinner, but now I'm forgiven. How many are glad you have a new identity? There's been a name change and a nature change to go with it. When you're saved, your name is written where? What name's written there? Is it Noah? 
Is it Jill? Is it Jerry? Is it Donnie? Is it Velma? Is it Kim? I happen to think, the Bible doesn't really clarify, I happen to think it's our new name to indicate we're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So think about this. When, it, when a, a woman gets married, what happens? A woman gets married, she changes her last name to indicate a change in relationship and in identity. She no longer identifies by her maiden name, who she was. She identifies as a wife in relationship with her husband, who she is. Her status has changed. So there's a name change to indicate a change in relationship. Praise God. What, what about this, uh, this saying? I love this old saying. I'm not what I want to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. How many can testify to that this morning? I'm not there yet. Look at somebody say, I'm not there yet. I haven't arrived, but I'm striving. I'm not what I want to be, but how many can say, thank God I'm not what I used to be. There's a change, a transformation taking place in our lives through the help of the Holy Spirit. Now think about this. If we're the bride of Christ and the Bible teaches that we are, then we have received and assumed his name. Uh, they, they first called the disciples Christians at Antioch. And that term Christian was used as a derisive slur. It was used as a put down. It was used to, to say, oh, they're just Christians. They're just followers of that, that Jesus. It came to mean Christ-like, which none of us are fully yet, but how many are striving to be like Christ? Hallelujah. It was meant as a put down. It was meant as an insult, but they wore it as a badge of honor. I don't know about you. I love that name. Hallelujah. I love the name of Christ. I love the name of Jesus. It's not an insult to me. It's a badge of honor that I'm identified with him. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. Now, did you, did you think about this before? Did you know Jesus will have a new name in heaven? You can flip over to the next page in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 12. And here's what it says. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. That means stable, stationary, permanent, a pillar. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And notice this, and I will write on him my new name. So apparently Jesus will have a new name in heaven as well. Why? I thought about that. And I got to thinking about how the name of Jesus, as beautiful as it is, as wonderful as it is, as powerful as it is, it's been cursed. It's been mocked. It's been drugged through the mud. It has been used as a, as a blasphemous term by many people. And he's going to have a new name in heaven that no sinner's lips have ever cursed. I need to say that again. He's going to have a new name revealed in heaven that no sinner's lips have ever cursed. Woo, hallelujah. Some people hate the name of Jesus. Some people despise the name of Jesus. Some people curse and, and blaspheme at the name of Jesus. But I've learned there's healing in that name. There's salvation in that name. There's power in that name. There's deliverance in that name. Hallelujah. But even Jesus will one day have a new name. It will indicate, again, a different identity. See, right now, we know him as Jesus, which means Jehovah is salvation, or Jehovah saves, because that's what we need right now, a Savior. But how many know when we're sealed into heaven, we won't need a Savior anymore? So he'll reveal a different aspect of his character by revealing a brand new name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Look at this with me. Revelation 22, 4, they shall see his face, talking of the new Jerusalem, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Something happened years ago that I still laugh at it when I think about it. Uh, when, when I was an evangelist, I was stationed in Cleveland, Tennessee. I lived there for five years. And uh, I, I was assigned a post office box. I didn't choose it. Wasn't, I had nothing to do with it. They assigned it. And the number was 5666. You know, people are really, ooh, superstitious about that number. 
And uh, somebody wrote me a mean old letter. A lady wrote me a letter. And she said, your ministry will never go anywhere with God if you don't get the mark of the beast off of your post office box. And see, if I had anything to do with it. By the way, if you study the book of Revelation, the mark of the beast is not 666. That's the number of his name. We don't know his mark. It has not been revealed. All right? But I'm not so worried about the mark of the beast. Why? I've already been marked. Oh, somebody didn't catch that. You know, everybody's all freaking out. Oh, oh they're going to put a, a computer chip in your right hand. Or they're going to put it in your forehead. It's going to be the mark of the beast. I've already been marked. If you could see in the unseen realm, in the invisible world, in the spirit realm, you would see souls that are marked with the blood of Jesus and souls that are not marked with the blood of Jesus. How many are glad you've been marked? You've been identified and sealed by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Let me, let me use an, an illustration or analogy here. Uh, the, the thing that comes to my mind is a brand. A brand indicates identification and ownership, right? Ranchers will take a hot branding iron. They'll put it, they'll, they'll pull it out of the fire when it's sizzling hot and they'll, they'll apply it to the hide of a cow and sizzle an emblem, a symbol or, or an initial into the hide of that cow and that identifies that cow as Farmer Brown's cow. Don't mess with him. He belongs to Farmer John or Farmer Brown, whoever. All right, what does it indicate? It indicates identification, but it also indicates ownership. Well, if his name will be put in us, his name placed in our forehead, what does that mean? That means we're identified with him, hallelujah, our heavenly father, and not only that, we've been branded as he's the one who owns us. Woo, hallelujah. How many glad he's the owner? We're just, we're just stewards. We're just caretakers. We're just managers. He owns it all. As one preacher said, the cattle on a thousand hills and the taters underneath them. Hallelujah. He owns it all. I've been branded. I'm identified with him. Praise God. Praise God. Now, let's, let's shift gears and let's, let's look at this. Well, let me mention this scripture. This is important. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I mentioned this during Sunday school. I want to mention it again. One of the biggest things we are up against right now is something called universalism. Universalism means that everybody's going to be saved. Everybody's going to heaven. Doesn't matter how you live, as long as you believe, you're fine. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches there's only one name. That's above every name. Jesus said, I am the way, not a way, the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Jesus said, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. How many glad you found the door? Hallelujah. Praise God. So you've got to go through his, his name and his plan. Now, let's shift gears and let's look at this stone. What does this mean? When he promises, he that overcomes will have a white stone... And in the stone, a new name written. What does that mean? I'm going to give you six things real quick to jot down. They all start with a P, so you should be able to write them down quick and, and mem uh, remember them. What does the meaning, what is the meaning of the white stone? Well, number one, it speaks of permanence. It indicates permanence. Anything that's made of stone is permanent. It's not temporary. It's, it's, it has to do with longevity. Flowers or wreaths will wilt or wither. Cloth or wood will rot. Metal will rust. Other materials deteriorate, but stones last forever. How many believe what God is doing in your life is going to last forever? Permanence. Amen? Things that are built of stone, they last. I was watching a documentary. We were watching it together, weren't we, Donnie? Uh, we were watching a documentary about uh, ten ancient cities. Ten of the greatest ancient cities on the History Channel. I mean, they covered Babylon. They covered Egypt. They covered Greece. They covered Rome. And what's amazing to me is some of these, these, uh, some of these temples and some of these ruins and some of these pyramids, they're still there after thousands and thousands of years. Anything made of stone, even though man may try to destroy it, is going to last. 
Hallelujah. So if God's going to give you a white stone, look at somebody and say, you're going to last. It speaks of permanence. Amen? In fact, I, I want to say this, Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, he that hath begun a good work and you will perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. He's going to finish what he started in your life. It's a permanent work. Amen? Here's the second thing. White stone speaks of purity. In Bible typology, in Bible symbolism, white is a symbol of righteousness. Let me give you an example. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 and 8 speaks of the bride of Christ and what she is adorned with. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. But let me add this. It's not our righteousness because our righteousness is filthy rags. It's imparted righteousness. It's his righteousness imparted to us by faith in Jesus Christ. Woo, hallelujah. You read it in another place in Revelation. Let me, let me flip over there real quick. Revelation chapter 7. Here's what it says in verse 9. And after this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man can number of all the nations, kindreds, and peoples of the earth. They stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes. Everybody say white robes. And had palms in their head. And the question was, verse 13, And one of the elders answered saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes and whence came they? And I said unto them, Sir, thou knowest. And he said, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The white stone indicates we've been made righteous in the sight of God, just as if we've never sinned. That's a work and a miracle of grace. All right, here's the third thing. The white stone also indicates a prize. In Bible times, winners of the Grecian or Roman games, we call them the Olympics now, but these athletic games were given, the winners were given a white stone as a trophy with their name engraved on it. 1 Corinthians, Paul alludes to this, chapter 9, verse 24. He says, Do you not know that those which run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain... And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate or self-controlled in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. See, they would run a race or they would do some kind of athletic competition. You know what they'd get for it? They'd get a wreath to put on their head. Well, that didn't last long. It would wither and wilt within a few days, few weeks. What do we get now in, in competition, Olympics? They give them a medal, right? Remember seeing them? Gold, bronze, silver. Wreaths don't last. All those other things, they may disintegrate after time, but you know what? We're, we're getting a medal that will never end. Paul called it this, 2 Timothy 4, 8. He said, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me and not to me only, but to all those that love his appearing. How many are running for the prize? Look at somebody say, keep your eyes on the prize. Hallelujah. It's not something temporary. It's not something earthly. It's not something tangible or material here in this world, but it's eternal. As someone said, the retirement plan for Christians is out of this world. Amen. All right, here's the next one. Uh, the white stone also indicates privileges. The white stone or prize was granted, uh, it granted the recipient social privileges such as access or admission like a ticket to events and exemption. Listen, this is a good part. Exemption from taxes and in some cases, other living expenses. The recipient sometimes what could live rent-free and tax-free. I mean, it sounds, that sounds like a good arrangement. Wouldn't that be nice? Especially with April 15 right around the corner. <laughs> Heard about the guy who, who had a troubled conscience and he couldn't sleep, so he wrote a letter to the IRS and said, Dear whom it may concern, I'm sending in my taxes. 
my back taxes. He said, and if I still can't sleep, I'll send in the rest. Oh, smile, it won't hurt you. It's just a joke. Hallelujah. A white stone indicated privileges. How many know it's a privilege to be a child of God? How many know we have privileges? Hallelujah. We have access to God Almighty. We have, praise God, the keys of the kingdom that have been given to us. Jesus said in Luke 12, 32, Fear not, little flock, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What's in the kingdom? All that God has and all that God is. He has it in reserve for his people. We've got, we've got a privilege. Hallelujah. Praise God. Jesus said, in my father's house, there are many dwelling places, many rooms. It's translated King James, many mansions. All right? Everything we receive from God is a gift of grace. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You can't pay for it. You just have to believe and receive it. It's a privilege to serve God. Amen? Here's the next one. I like this. This is probably my favorite. The white stone indicated pardon. In court, jurors in Bible times would use black stones to vote guilty on a defendant. They use white stones to vote not guilty. If the defendant was acquitted of guilt, they were given a white stone as a special token or as proof of their innocence. And if anybody accused them of that crime, they could simply produce that stone and say, uh-uh, I've been acquitted, I've been exonerated, hallelujah, I've been proven innocent in a court of law. Well, how many know the accuser of the brethren is always trying to condemn you? He's always telling you you're not worthy. He's always telling you God's not going to use you because of what you've done. I say the devil is a liar. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. doesn't mean you're a perfect person. It means you're striving to please God. And if you've genuinely repented and confessed your sin, they're underneath the blood of Jesus, hallelujah, never to be brought against you ever again. You've been exonerated. You've been acquitted. How many are glad? Hallelujah. He has set you free from condemnation. I need to say this. Somebody needs to hear this today. There's no sin too big for the blood of Jesus to handle. There's no failure in your life too great for the grace of God to overcome. Hallelujah. We've been pardoned. There's a song in our hymn book that says, Mercy, there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. We've been pardoned. Here's the last one. The white stone indicated prosperity. An honored guest would receive a white stone which would give them credit in the marketplace paid for by the city. Basically like a gift card. You been, anybody been to Disney World? Now they're getting really high tech. When we went with Emily, it was uh, her senior year, and uh, their cheer squad was going down to cheer in the parade. We went down to Disney World, and, and, and they didn't even give us a ticket. They gave us a, a wristband. And that wristband was amazing. It not only served as your ticket, every ride you went on, access to the park, it was also your motel key. And if you want any room service, man, everything was on that. A little scary, to be honest with you. <laughs> Thing is, you say, put it on my account, put it on my room, put it on my tap. The problem is I had to pay for it. <laughs> We're going to be given a white stone. Hallelujah. And the good news is we won't have to pay for anything. It's all been paid for. It's all provided by your heavenly father. Woo, hallelujah. The emperor would go to these events, perhaps at the, at the Colosseum or, or some other place, and, and they would literally throw out these white stones and the recipients could use them as credit in the marketplace. If they needed corn, they could go get corn. If they needed clothes, they could go get clothes. Whatever they needed, they could go and get it and it would be paid for by the city as a gift from the emperor. 
Woo, hallelujah. How many glad we're not serving an evil emperor. We're serving a gracious, loving, heavenly father who's paid for everything you need. Hallelujah. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. I want you to do this in seriousness. I want you to look at somebody and say, God wants to bless you. A lot of people have this, this view of God that's, that's not right, that he's some big mean ogre in the heaven with a baseball bat ready to clobber you over the head. Listen, it's not his will that anybody should perish. It's his will that everyone comes to repentance. He has good things in store for you. Get rid of the bitterness. Get rid of the hate. Get rid of all the baggage from your past and give it up and let him bless you today. He wants to bless you. Let me close with this thought. 3 John 1, 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health. Here's the catch. Even as your soul prospers. People want to prosper in material things, but their soul is not prospering. God wants to bless you financially and materially. Yes, but it's not to hoard. It's to be a channel of blessing. But he wants your soul to prosper. And your soul prospers when you're in right relationship with your heavenly father. Just as the emperor would shower his subject with gifts, God's love loves to shower his children with blessings. An emperor would be wealthy and lack nothing and would give away gifts to show his favor and his benevolence. Listen, if you being evil know how to give good things to your children, how much more? Say it with me. How much more does your heavenly father delight to bless his children? Hallelujah. Amen. So here's the promise. To every overcomer, you're going to get a new name and a white stone. Say it with me. A new name and a white stone. And that's just a small portion of the great inheritance God has in store for his children. Will you stand with me, please? Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for the new name that indicates a new relationship, a new nature. God touch it. A mother barely 20 She's out there on her own A teenage boy in prison Before he's even grown The illness of a loved one A widow no one calls Listen, but there is one solution There's an answer for it all There is power in the name Just fighting for our lives. We're a church that needs revival. Maybe a broken man and wife. Listen, but in the name of Jesus, all those chains of bondage fall. You see, your prayers are heard and answered when God's children call.
As a seven-year-old boy, Ben Godwin was hit by a car traveling 30 miles an hour. Three inches of his shin bone lay on the road beside him. He faced amputation of his leg or being crippled for the rest of his life. Yet God performed a creative miracle. The bone was miraculously restored. From that day on, Ben participated in sports and walks without a limp. Today, he operates in the supernatural healing of others. In this book, you will read the riveting faith-building story and see for yourself the documented proof of one of the most verified miracles of our day. It will convince even the greatest skeptic. Call now to get Ben Godwin's brand new book, God's Strategy for Tragedy. This book contains revelation from God and biblical teaching answering the most asked questions concerning tragedies. Does God still perform miracles? Why does God allow tragedies to occur? Where do tragedies come from? What should our reaction be when we are faced with tragedies? How can you receive your miracle? How can you begin to walk in the supernatural and see the miracle power of God in your ministry? And so much more. Don't miss out on getting Ben Godwin's brand new book, God's Strategy for Tragedy. Hello, everyone. This is Pastor Ben Godwin thanking you for watching our broadcast today. I pray it has been a blessing and a source of spiritual enrichment for you and your family. I want to remind you that every program we air is available on DVD for a donation of $5 or more. If you would like a copy, please send your request and donation to Good Springs Full Gospel Church, P.O. Box 3161, Jasper, Alabama, 35502. 